I'm starting the recording and let's do this live. So part of this is that we get the hands-on practice on this. So everybody, anybody who has a computer, uh, take it out because we can practice some of the things that we're preaching right now regarding uh, collaborative literacy. Because part of that is using common accessible tools like wikis, Google Docs, FreeCAD <coughs> to do rapid development. Uh, so if you guys want to go to the OSC Machine Design Guide page on the wiki, it's in the chat box, and then hit on the lesson one, which is collaborative literacy. And what I'd like to do is that we all take notes during this. So if you go to the first lesson, OSC Design Manual Collaborative Literacy, click on Edit underneath that document. So, is everyone... Could you say again where we're supposed to go? Yeah. So, on the wiki, go to the OSC Design Manual. Um, let me do this. Let me. Uh, if you search design manual on the top, it should take you to design. Well, okay. Design manual redirects to design guide, redirects to OSC machine design guide. Yeah. So, one way you can access that if you can't find on a wiki is go on the left hand side and this is part of wiki wiki syntax go into research sorry recent week wiki changes at the osc wiki and you can also see that and that's part of the tools that we use one of the useful features of the wiki is you can see who edited it last and that way you can track contributions right now practical thing about that is that we have the OSC machine design guide as the top thing because I just edited that a little bit and you can access that. So if you find that, please get into the document itself. And the idea here was that we can collaboratively create documents real time, live, um, with a large team of people, which is in theory scalable to any number of people. The idea is then, well, how do you get the audience to contribute to that? Well, you have to have something compelling and the way we're we're doing that uh, in our experiments is, is incentivizing that, uh, incentivizing device design contributions through the incentive challenge of next year, which is going to be our big next experiment of how many people can work collaboratively. So that's, that's coming up next year, uh, building upon all the different techniques. But since about the 90s and 2000s, wikis became very common, and Wikipedia became the like the n number one website in the world almost one of the very very top websites and that uses a wiki called media wiki we use the same tool we use me me media wiki for the open source ecology wiki so it's the same open source software but the concept with that is that just tremendous amounts of people can contribute to that um, but wikipedia for example it's it's not easy to do because you have to coordinate people it's not just like you you let a bunch of wild people run run onto a wiki there's a lot of effort behind on the back end that makes it happen for example wikipedia has a 30 million dollar budget just to make sure you can click edit and edit their wiki they mm -hmm. have different contributors different managers of all the different pages so i don't know the exact figure but it's not like wikipedia is written by billions of people it's primarily you know, it, it is a lot of people, but it's primarily a, a core group of developers. Some of the people are paid to actually manage pages. Others are just plain volunteer. Because you can right now edit the wiki, Wikipedia, or the OSC wiki, and that does work. Over time, the, the value of the contributions is enhanced. But we have those tools available to anybody. You can set up a wiki readily on a server. You can use an existing one from Wikipedia to open source ecology or whatever wiki you want to contribute to. It's a great tool if you want to start a project and you want people to contribute in a massive decentralized way. Uh, that's a tool that you can't, really cannot go without as shown by Wikipedia. So that's, you know, it's proven technology. Still a lot of people are not particularly familiar with it or par particularly familiar with the culture that you can actually edit and slash through people's contributions and do that. That's, that's exactly uh, what we want to do. We want to uh, build 
be not shy about contributing to a page, starting content. And a lot of people kind of question that, well, what does that do? But the truth is, um, you could start with a, it's called a stub, like a, just a small page, but if, if quality people look at it, and it depends on who looks at it, but it can in, increase over time. So just because it's crappy at the beginning, doesn't necessarily mean it should be deleted, it should be improved. That's, that's the kind of culture that there is. If you see a problem, you have the agency to, to actually improve it and make it better. So, so Wikipedia, the Wiki, the OSC Wiki, Media Wiki, are very powerful tools. So with that said, uh, if you click on the recent wiki changes on the wiki, and that's part of the, the understanding of a wiki, like how do you navigate through a wiki, is, that's one of the core tools that we use. Uh, the good thing about it is you can edit pages, but you can also embed any, any kind of content, from Facebook pages to any kind of embeddable content, so images, videos, websites. So using templates, because you can template everything with HTML or CSS, you can make, use, use like this blank slate of a wiki, to create beautiful things like our wiki is you know we don't have too much formatting too many different templates but if we create professional templates if you know see HTML and CSS you can completely make it just outstanding like take the content that we have right now and make it sparkle and just it's so, so one side is the content which is the wiki that's it it's only a database it's a basic database a huge database it can be displayed in many ways, but on top of that, you add the visualization and the usability, indexing, and all of that, and that's that's how it can work. But through a process like that, you can take, you can continuously, and forever upgrade the quality of information to something that, that is really really good. So go, please go into now. So on the OSC machine design guide, if you're on the Martin, do you want what's on your screen on the screen behind you? you Not exactly, because I want you to be looking at the screen of the... Of, I want everybody to actually edit what we're working on. So, click... Yeah. I, I suspect I'm not the only one that uh, doesn't yet have an account. I think Let's I start submitted with that. a request for that earlier, but I'm not going to say I've been approved. Okay. Excellent. So the first thing we do in order to, to edit a wiki is request an account, which is on the top right. That's a good point. So let's start with that. And if you have requested an account, <clears throat> if you have not requested one, if you don't have one, please do that right now and, and see how that looks. So as an administrator, I have account requests. Like, for example, I see Devin, Eamon. Let's approve all these people. We know them. They're here. <laughs> so confirm, accept. Yep. Uh, comment the it'll the biography needs to be at least fifty words long, or it'll tell you to do it again. <laughs> Happened to me twice. I skip that. Yeah. <laughs> I so so make sure you do a little biography. Um, so that's the first experiment that collaborative. Editing. Now with the wiki, the wiki is cloud editable collaboratively editable but it is not real-time editable only one person can edit a page at a time otherwise you have conflicts so you can run into those conflicts but how do you collaborate truly seamlessly you have to add the element of real-time visually collaborative and that is Google Docs that's what we use right now um, I haven't found yet the open source alternatives that are better than Google Docs in terms of being truly usable, as in you want to be able to, to do text, do images, uh, do simple drawings. So Google presentations are something we commonly use and embed in a wiki so that we can work with a number of people and edit, and you see the edit changes right on the screen. That's an extremely powerful thing. If you have a big team of people, uh, say you've got take OSC as a development organization we've got we've developed our team to hundreds or thousands of people we can call forth for a uh, what we we do sometimes is design sprints and you can go through a complete just just create a lot of content by once again dividing content say you're designing a machine so you once again you do the modular breakdown you can break it down you can break it down into parts different development ideas like I was talking about in um, initial session on day one where we're by modular breakdown 
using known interface design. In other words, you know how the things fit together. You can distribute tasks to many, many people. So granularity is the, the key to scalable parallel development. And a tool like the wiki that allows you to embed docs and other all kinds of content. And then uh, and specifically the Google Docs, which are real-time collaborative. You will see what everybody else is doing at the same time. You can open up 50 pages, probably like 50 I would say, typically I've seen like 50 might be the limit, maybe 100, maybe it depends on your, sp your speed of your connection. But you can start a document, add a page, each person here can add a page, so let's do that. Let's let's do exactly that. So say we have Okay, so first let's approve more accounts here. So uh, all the people that are on please please request an account and I'm confirming that like right now as we speak. Uh I see Eamon and Timothy Holman that I'm approving right now. and somehow our speed is getting bogged down i i, I was getting like five meg or people yeah i just ran a speed test it's very slow oh, what's going on like uh is someone uploading yeah i don't know anybody, up anybody uploading or downloading anything yeah we're just a uh, little bit slow on this here. Um, okay, so we're we're just gonna reset the router here because we're like a five meg out of a two hundred meg line. Yeah, so we're gonna just unplug for thirty seconds here. Our speed seems to be quite a bit down. Oh, unplug the workshop? Okay. Oh, wait, actually. Go back to the research. Let's see what numbers we Because there's two S's. Yeah, I'm going to go into that. Because it's searching. Speedtest.net. And what you're seeing here, everybody, you know, people remote too, um, definitely got to have the fast connection if you're going to do scalable development and maybe you know if, if we're having trouble right now maybe turn off the video here uh, on my side maybe people turn off the video if you've got the video connection so I'm, I'm recording this so it's this is being recorded for everybody um, <coughs> so I'm on the confirm account requests for the wiki and still a bit. No, not yet. Um, let's yeah, let's just reboot this router right here. Telling me that I have an account when I try and sign up, and I don't have an account. I would check yeah, I just said the same thing over here. Oh, really? Yeah, no. you can't request. Maybe it's all the same idea. Ah, that's part of the begins. Yeah. Oh yeah, like if you have like a filter. Yeah. Don't know. It could be um. <laughs> Yeah, I bet that's what it is. If you, you hammer it, it's going to just look at the same IP address and hammering it, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> that's how you filter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Okay, let's see. The web should be back up now. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Unforeseen problem. Yeah, no, we've, we've got to.
fix that. There's, I think there's some issues on our back end as far as people's ac accounts getting requested. Um, okay, so we're getting back on that. So let's see speed test, how it's looking right now. Okay. Well, it's about eight or so meg, nine ten, <coughs> improved. No. Oh no. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, maybe there's a variety of proxy services you can. Okay, to yeah. Not it seems like we're having some issues on <laughs> approving people's accounts. Let's, let's just g roll forward with the content that I was going to present and maybe uh, let's try to fix this a little later. So. OSC design guide, the first lesson, which is collaborative literacy. So let's t hit some of the main topics of, of that. Um, so collaborative literacy. I'll paste into the I'm pasting into the chat window the direct link to the editable document. Now for that you actually don't need to be logged into the wiki to edit documents that are embedded in a wiki. So that's that's another turnaround. But and I don't think you even need to be logged into Google, do you? If an, if a document is completely freely editable, I believe that anybody, including the person that's not signed into Google, can edit it. Is that, I've, is that I've so? I've at least or? edited uh, pages on Wikipedia with, uh, without logging in. Yeah. Uh, so... So let me share the link into the chat box, the direct editable link is this one. Yeah, sorry, already requested account issues. Okay, so please take a look at the chat box and bottom bottom left is the chat box you can get the direct so you go, um, oh man this document is neat dot maybe we should just email it to the group because that would take a while for them to go to it. Okay. Um can you guys in the remote side see the collaborative literacy document? Or not really? What is it um, here? You pasted it in the chat, but I don't have the chat up. Yeah, I'm waiting for it to pull up still. Um, Yeah, we're somewhat failing on the the collaborative tools here, but <laughs> they do work. Uh, one of the issues is that I just called today, and they I was told that no, we're on 200 meg, not one gig. So that w we can probably do better on Monday when they open up. So, but they can't do that today. Uh, they did not. I mean, they said they switched it, and I called back and they said they did it, but, uh, I mean, the specs say 200 right now, so... Um, okay. Yeah. So, I, I do see, if you go into the document, now I see like two, four, six people in that document, and then I can go into the advanced settings on that, and change the permission to on public on the web. Anyone on the internet can find an access, no sign in required. So absolute seamless collaboration in, in principle if you can do it. So for anybody that's editing, 
uh, or in the document you can create new pages and so forth so what I will do is start starting some of the topics here and just go through the main points but ideally what we would do is um, and the remote people if you have good bandwidth please take notes in it so this is a collaboratively edited document and um, we will glad be glad to add you as an editor of this document on the front cover page so let's just go through uh, some of the issues and and main points about uh, collaborative liter literacy and so we access? Say it again. Do you want us to have edit access? Yeah. Because it says comment only. Mm -hmm. um, try again. I just refreshed the page and it still just says comment only. Oh. Mm -hmm. Can find and edit. Where do you see that? Can change. Anyone with link? Public on the web. Can mm -hmm. view and edit. <clears throat> okay. Try again. Try again, please. Um, why do we make this big fuss about collaborative literacy? It's because as a collaborative project, that's the core of our work. We, we're trying to say, okay, how to get leverage millions of people, uh, how, what we all can do with to make a better world with open hardware technology. That's my last line in the TED Talk. And we mean that, but you have to have truly open tools that are accessible to anyone. And do we have access? <laughs> are you guys? To the document? Yeah, for yeah. editing. Yes. It should, be, it should be good. Refresh if it's not. So, um, we have talked about open software dominating the marketplace. Um, there were critical collaborative tools there, like GitHub, email lists, that made it possible initially. And that's why Linux was born in the 90s and then it, it took over, uh, it became a big project. The tools were there to handle massive amounts of contributions. So. Um, trying to do the same for hardware, we're finding that this collaborative des design part is difficult for a lot of people, and that's why we want to emphasize the idea that we can do more together than, than working alone, which is, a, of course, an obvious concept, but in practice, you have to have both the culture and the tools to do it. And right now, we're, you know, we're playing with the tools to do that, like wikis and Google Docs and FreeCAD, where you can readily download, edit, so download from the wiki, upload to the wiki. We can use GitHub, or, which is a repository. But the wiki itself is a version control system. You can upload a file, and it tra tracks it in history. Like You can then go upload a new version of this file. That's an amazing feature. So if you're doing work with many, many people, say you, you're working on a CAD project, we encourage to download it and if you're editing it upload it as soon as you've got some changes and that can be scaled you can revert back to old versions of files and, and manage a development project that way without necessarily using github and it, it works all on the wiki but for the wiki we're actually in pre preparation for many more people contributing, we're limiting the file size to only one meg for the design files, so we encourage people to... Well, one meg, three kind of is huge. Yeah, if you break things down into into small components like we, we like to, we, we limit that at the one meg because we're assuming that, okay, eventually we're going to have hundreds and thousands of people editing, and then the amount of memory it would take to constantly be uploading furiously one meg, you know, larger than one meg files would just get really overtax the the server so we're actually limiting that to one one meg but it's plenty to to do pictures and other content and huge wiki pages um, in order to be able to track that effectively so the culture is important and we emphasize the that as a literacy just like you can read and write those are li basic literacies are mathematical like you can count things you you're literate in say science or whatever collaboration is just another major topic that you kind of need a an awareness and an understanding of that for you to to be collaborative um, and for for the open hardware world we we're saying that there, there's really huge societal impact to that because we're talking about if you're sharing information that's related to real products, real design, that means that information is economically significant. It 
it means that you can generate livelihoods for it and for that reason most people are like oh no I can't share that and that's why you've got the, the whole patent system companies as, as the norm hide everything and keep others from taking that so so there are just huge blocks in terms of human culture why collaboration doesn't happen because it goes down to the reptilian brain like we talked about yesterday where you actually get afraid like okay if I share this information how am I gonna be able to make a living if, if I get copied and so forth so it requires a change in psychology that's why I talk about as w one of the first things it's like you have to have that courage it's like the courage to share the co courage to be vulnerable because you're theoretically endangering your own survival if you have a scarcity mindset I mean because it, it doesn't work like that it's the more you you share you can make a very good case that the more you share the more innovation comes about the more you can use the abundant resources that are there we said that there's 10,000 times more power that comes from the Sun than we use so from first principles there is a question well I'm not exactly a question just a comment that it seems like also there might be a factor of people are more likely to buy a thing that makes sense to them, like rather than gambling on some service they've never heard of this principle of operation before. So by sharing these principles uh, and making them a little bit more well-known, people uh, considering buying this stuff may be more like, well, I've heard that it works in other places, this, maybe it's a good option, and may buy your stuff. Mm -hmm. So that it maybe it could be beneficial in a more direct way to share. Right, it absolutely is more beneficial to share because sharing is, is kind of like our, our revenue model, our business model is to share because we're, empower we're developing things, we can ourselves sell stuff, but the more people know about it, the simple thing is it's sharing is marketing, right? That's it's the most powerful marketing you can do because it also creates goodwill. So it's that shift of psychology that you know, a lot of people ask, well, how do I make money uh, doing open source stuff? Uh, that's a long discussion, but the idea is that nothing prevents you from selling things, just like you do if, if your stuff were proprietary. It's, it's just uh, the open source and collaboration refers to the development part. So the money-making part, that's like a separate thing. So when people uh, think about collaboration and open source for the hardware, they immediately jump to the fact, oh, like... Am I giving away products? They kind of get confused between the, the information aspect of it and the physical aspect of it. Because the physical aspect is always going to require resources and, and hardware, matter, atoms that you get from the earth. And it typically has a cost associated with it, unless we, we get to free energy. But um, there are costs for the real hardware, and it does make a significant impact upon people's lives so it really hits into the human psychology so uh, when I talk about the issues of collaboration psychology the first thing I go to is like okay this is our evolution of the reptilian brain where through history we were struggling like right now we have it so good about in about the 50s production has way outstripped consumption or maybe you can even make a case for the 1920s when advertising really started to come in we have very clearly outstripped our ability to consume things. We are extremely productive and successful. Um, but our brains are still like 10,000 or 100,000 years old. How, like, w when did like Homo sapiens come about? What is it like? What is that number? 250,000 in Meso Mesopotamia, where you guys are from, or somewhere, or Africa, wherever. But those changes on a because the technology has accelerated so much in recent history um, it's way outstripped our more deep psychology so that is really the essential like if you look at the the cause here of where is open source hardware going it really gets into that level so that's why we need to create new culture in order for the transition to to happen so um, real scarcity used to exist it does not today is a, is a main point about that and if we recognize that then we're in a better position to collaborate with people to use the abundant resources that are out there so uh, and, and then of course you've got many institutions that enforce 
the proprietary or the concentration of wealth or um, the, the world in general you can say very clearly is designed it's like why are there so many poor people oh, it's not like all oh, these poor people just you know they're there no there's structures there's infrastructures and institutions that exist um, basically colonialism or neo-colonialism or or today's institutions such as the corporation uh, the education system um, uh, I look a lot into the like for example the corporate charter as a like that's a I think that's a huge issue in the sense that like corporate charters and patents are two very very visible scarcity enforcing mechanisms uh, because the corporation charter says you gotta like you required by law you know in, a, in essence by law you're required to make money for investors so so your governance document is actually telling you you gotta plunder you gotta do some things that are not nice it's legally written in there it's like you cannot not do that or you actually be legal legally liable for for respecting nature and people it's crazy it's a, it's a totally insane institution that came about i guess with uh the first trading company is probably like in the 1600s that's where the corporation was born if my history is right or so but it's a it's a very pernicious thing um you can read about it some good books i mean i read uh, when corporations rule the world um that's a good one the corporation is a good book on the topic i got that book from scott there uh, he 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 knows that um yeah it's a th like the corporation existed the, the idea that you know it's great you can raise tons of money for a project but the one of the issues with with this investment model as we know it is that you're totally divorcing the meaning or viability of something from its inherent worth uh, in one way so the idea is in the corporate financial structures of today you are saying okay we, we are creating institutions that allow us to raise loads of money and therefore in some way you are divorcing yourself from the responsibility of okay you started a project it's successful you got a ton of funding for it well where is the check and balance that says that's actually worth doing you know so a lot of the world that exists today is based on this kind of model where there is no check and balance as far as that and that's part of the structure. You can argue that's great. You can argue that it's not good. I don't think it's good. Personally, I like the idea that we have to prove ourselves that actually our stuff works and people want it, as opposed to we threw buttloads of money on it and lots of advertising on it, and people want it because that you know they're brainwashed into thinking that's all there is. So we got to look start by looking at the institutions that enforce various means of scarcity. Um, the the patent issue is definite definite one and yokai benkler he's a scholar on open source topics he discusses the idea of how these days people think that intellectual property law is like a law of nature uh, people literally think that you cannot do otherwise that's how everybody does it uh, if you go against that you're violating a law but we're forgetting that it's a human-made law these these laws are uh, the patents the idea of patents the fact that you know we're, we're making things proprietary just so we can uh, theoretically for the idea that we can recoup our investments um, which is in principle very good but of course the system gets very much abused by people trolling and uh, just the system is kind of broken down in the sense that uh, from what I understand is that the patent system is so overloaded that people are throwing all kinds of crazy things up there and the, and the patent examiners can't really assess it well and patents can happen for like anything and then whole loads whole realms of endeavor pretty much like cut off like you just can't do it because you're violating patents you're gonna get sued and stuff like that um, and then some people make a living of just trawling you know there's patents and they will sue people and it doesn't even have to be their patent I think that's mm -hmm. I think trawling is you just make money by suing people because uh, you look you know it's it's some crazy things that go out there um, but we have to kind of examine all these institutions that are out there that that enforce the way we live today um, and we're because we're in that system we're we're kind of thinking that oh that's you know that's how it is and 
that's the rules. But it's it's very much as as the theme goes here. It's negotiable. We are we have the agency to change all these kinds of things. But first, it starts by understanding that that's possible. So it's uh, once again the the mental expansion that's required to say that um, yes, first of all, these things do exist because. Uh, the worst thing that can happen to us, you know, the stuff that where we don't know that we don't know and we don't question it, right? That that thing is very dangerous for society. So, so we also know that open source has succeeded in software. Uh, Linux has succeeded. Uh, I, I mentioned that it was co-opted in some way in the sense that the Gini coefficient, which is the measure of distribution of wealth, hasn't improved since Linux came about or the 90s, or if it has, uh, uh, Gini coefficient being the, the metric that measures the distribution of wealth, zero being uh, perfect distribution, meaning everybody has the same amount of money or wealth. Mm -hmm. One is one person owns all the wealth in the world. Uh, we're at about 0.7. It's not visibly going down right now, so um, if open source software to, took to its full conclusion, we would have that drop significantly if knowledge is power and if power if that knowledge is distributed right so theoretically you can say oh well the natural tendency of that is that uh, knowledge which is power when you come down to it or and economic power that would tend to distribute a question here oh, Michael? No, that wasn't a question. I was just okay um, so that's not happening and, and then we, we gotta look at why is that not happening and what can we do differently in, in hardware to <clears throat> to make it happen? And, and what are we working against? And and the late, you know the, the thing that we think about <clears throat> in terms of what's stopping that kind of collaboration is one is that fear, but fear of people and the reptilian brain part, um, cult, cult, how your people are cultured, um, level of self-esteem in people because to, in order to be able to collaborate openly you have to be vulnerable so you have to have good esteem in order for you to be able to put yourself out there otherwise you're just oh I'm, I can't do that I'm gonna get racked by people so you kinda have to have to be resilient or anti-fragile meaning that if you get hit you learn from it it's kinda the growth mindset idea it, I think I would say that open source is not easy because it does have these psychological demands from you because you have to be able to somewhat defend your defend your viewpoint it's a, it's a constant engagement it's not something you hide in a corner and you pepper the world with armchair theory it's something where you kind of <laughs> gotta engage and yeah engage more um, and uh, s s the um, I mentioned that we're, how do you incentivize people? We've had, <clears throat> in the overall history of the project, we've had people come and go uh, constantly. It's not easy to, to raise a big community of people. Uh, but some of the learnings are, we did a Kickstarter on the Open Building Institute. We got like 100K uh, for that to do the CD go home. But one of the comments that came out of that, one of the learnings was someone suggested that we should do if we haven't found out about it, pick up the book called Bold by P Peter Diamandis, Diamandis and read about that because he, he talks about um, collaborative development like crowd development and set of challenges. It's a pretty good book. I do recommend it. And reading that, uh, you know, the obvious conclusions from it are that incentive challenges do work where Things like the X Prize and now a sh um, an offshoot of the X Prize called Hero X, which is the platform we're planning to use. Um, you throw out a, a crowd development prize, and people end up spending much more effort than the prize itself, like tens or a hundred times more. Like one team might spend five million on a million dollar prize, and many people do that. Like many teams do that. How collaborative do the do these projects usually end up being? Like, cause it seems like if people are still competing for a prize, there's at least a, a oh, okay. instinct to, to yeah, compete. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's that's where we can negotiate the rules, and and the rules are exactly like that. They're competing. There's a bunch of teams that are working towards a prize, but they're each working themselves. That's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna incentivize that that you get rewarded for p first publishing. So that's how you share and then reusing other people's and you get credit if some, somebody reuses it and you're encouraged to do that and we're going to do 
collaborative design events where your participation counts as a plus for that. So rewrite the rules absolutely that instead of pe all the people com competing, they're actually collaborating. So I think that in itself will be such a mind shift for a lot of the, the community that's viewing that. So we should do a good video on that, by all means, to, to, to point out that difference. Because we're not talking about 100 teams competing, we're talking about 100 teams collaborating. Theoretically, you would get 100 times the, the quality, you know, if you do it, if you can really leverage that. So that's, that's how we will do that. And um, what else is, is worthwhile sharing about that, uh, the incentive challenge, uh, we will rewrite the rules on that very big point about it so uh, throughout all of this we talk about bootstrapping right well how do you bootstrap if you want to get a huge incentive challenge prize we're talking for, for us for the the 3d printed cordless drill made from trash including the the infrastructure for recycling plastic okay two hundred fifty thousand dollars well there's different ways to do that for us we're gonna go to the business community and and all that through some of the contacts that we have uh, my mentor will also help set you help out on that. But uh, the beauty about the platform of HeroX is that you can crowdsource the crowd challenge prize too. So there's no limit to what you can do. So so it really begins with okay, what is your idea? What do you want to do? It is so feasible to come up with a hairy idea, but uh, and get it funded. But you have to do the due diligence on ideas. So because crazy ideas don't get funded, you have to have a good idea about execution. Um, but the capital barriers are no longer an excuse since the 90s, since Kickstarter, since, since crowdfunding, since whenever the collaborative funding, like whatever no, internet collaborative funding structures came about, starting with Kickstarter, which was a big, uh, pretty much Kickstarter started a lot of that movement of crowdfunding. Um, now that's completely feasible and dedicated platforms like HeroX exi exist exactly for this purpose. So what blew me away about the, the HeroX is the idea that they support and have the feature in their platform where you crowdfund the prize itself. So the missing ingredient is the idea. Um, a team but not necessarily a full team because you can crowdsource the talent if you're incentivizing it properly. So it could be a very small core team of people with a very good idea that can move mountains without uh, you know, the kind of stuff that huge investors of yesterday could do. Is that, that is accessible to each one of us, uh, pending our ability to come up with good ideas. Um, but I think the when we talk about collaborative literacy, the idea of changing the world, the kind of stuff you know we're talking about, about availing technology to everybody and uh, changing the world, I mean, it's a good idea. Um, an idea where you're simply saying everybody wins, everybody collaborates. That can take on many, many forms. It could be applied to any kind of product development, but I think the the important thing about what you choose for a topic of such a challenge would be that, and it has to be important, it has to have impact, so, uh, but if you can think of something like that, anyone could do it, it's, it's just beautiful the way it works right now, um, it's feasible, completely feasible to do that. Um, Let's talk about the, the capacity of what replication is, because that's uh, like what <clears throat> is the value of open blueprints? So some people like Joshua Pierce, he's a professor at Michigan Tech University, have actually written a paper on the value, the valuation of an open blueprint. Well, how do you va evaluate what, what a, an openly published design is? Well, very simply, it's like one formula could be, okay, you, you say, okay, here's a, a plan for something. It's worth X dollars. Uh, X people download it. So, so one way you can count is, okay, so many people are projected to download it over time. I say a thing on Thingiverse, which is a repository of 3D printed designs. Um, whenever somebody prints something, 
that's a certain value but the idea there is that you can come up with some estimates that if you have a really good design that is worth so much um, pending one's ability to replicate it now with 3d printing it's becoming obvious to a lot of people that oh all I need is that design because the 3d printer is going to do the rest of the work so uh, the barriers that exist to recognizing or capturing the value of an open design they're going down in other words we can um, um, I think it's becoming more visible so so as we go into the next economy of abundance we can say okay if there's ample open source design wow we can translate to physical realities because the the productive infrastructures necessary to to turn it into reality as are becoming more and more accessible and if they're open source low cost then the value of something is huge but what do you need for something um, for you to convert an idea in, like the blueprint into practice it gets kind of subtle we were talking about how what exactly is all the information required to, to for you to to be able to do that uh, so we talked about there's the tooling, bills of materials, production engineering, quality control, uh, materials like sourcing, uh, all those business things that you have to consider to bring something from a blueprint to a real design. Um, now, the point about that for me uh, that that's worth noting is if that design is available one you can okay you can convert that to physical reality pending having the tools not everybody has the tools you can also modify that so if you have access um, to the source file so that's the nature of open source right source refers to the source code for physical objects that's CAD if you have those files you can modify them so the value of a particular design becomes even more huge because you can customize it and that's why we emphasize we're we're like are when when we vet people to collaborate with okay the first question is okay are you using open source software is your license open and so forth because if they have an open design but it's in an inaccessible format uh that limits li limits that so so you have the the design itself and the modification. I would make the claim that the the ability to modify that is much more powerful, especially with the way we design it, which is in a modular way, and scalable kind of design method. The value of the modifiability is much greater. Take 10x, let's say, 10 times, just just to say that it's like 10 times more valuable than that so so that's why when you look at a project the first thing you gotta say okay what is can I modify their stuff do they have enough information to do that so you have to be able to pick out okay first do you have like open source free CAD files or if it's circuits do you have that in KiCad which is open source circuit design software that's it's a very important question um, when you examine okay can we collaborate with someone you gotta have the open tools the the open design uh, the design tools have to be open for that the, the value of that to be really really high but if that's there then and the access to all those tools is free or widespread that lends itself to mass collaboration so you know companies like for example Autodesk that have expensive software I mean they cannot make an honest claim to say we can do a truly collaborative process because only so many people can afford their software um, or people in universities can only uh, access that and you're leaving out 99 percent of the world so it's critical use the open tools and so forth uh, so we we really pay attention to that because the value of something when it's open uh, the four freedoms you can look at it you can modify it you can produce it you can sell it when those four things are available each one of those gives huge economic potential impact to the value of that open hardware design and 
if we truly understand that, that should be enough motivation for many people to take average, you know, like a lot of the things in the current economy and taking them and open sourcing them. And each one of those could become, um, you know, like there's corporations making these things today, there's centralized production. Huge distribution of production can happen and is likely to happen if people absorb this mindset that, wow, like the value is huge. And, it's, and it can be, when it's open source, uh, I mentioned one of the biggest values of that is the closed loop material cycles. When it's open source, you can modify it, you can change it, you can fix it. It's a huge economic impact for the circular economy. Um, so that's, that's an important aspect of, of open source. So for OSE specifically, we have, um, we put in a bunch of properties it's called OSC specifications and there's a page on the wiki by that name and there's like uh, so if you pull that up what is it? it's called OSC specifications and we've got about you know there's like 50 or how many we've got right now there's a list of 60 items that are the critical design features of everything that we do uh, towards that that effort of being open source uh, accessible collaborative um, low barriers to entry all those those good things so we can go through those in detail um, I won't go maybe too much in that but just go through some of them like how how do you generate huge potential change so open source obviously distributive economics we talk about that the idea that you can publish the designs, but it's even more worthwhile if you publish how you can make a living out of that through some kind of an open enterprise model that people can replicate. That is our core goal. Because we do not stop at the design, we want to distribute that, and that is economic, economically significant production. Because one of the core things we need to remember as we go forward as a society is that that intensely productive system that we have today we need to ha retain the productivity, eliminate the waste, internalize the ecology part, and internalize the, the human rights issues. Um, but those, those things can happen, but we need to retain a good level of productivity that allows us to have a life where we spend only a small fraction of the time taking care of the needs of life, and the rest is for our self-determination. So we talk a lot about being super cooperators, not superstars. And trying to do that here, we're trying to get people to, okay, first person that finishes, let's help everybody get to the same point so that we can all finish as opposed to being uh, having a few laggards who do not get the satisfaction of finishing. So by teaching, we learn ourselves. It's like if you want to learn something, teach it. And that's why I'm doing... <laughs> So I'm learning to do the open source microfactory by teaching about the open source microfactory. It's it's like such an experience where I really have to first question all the things that I thought I knew or whatever, and um, get deeper into them, be able to explain them, be able to apply them in a better way. So cooperate, don't be a superstar because the superstar thing, uh, you know, like they talking about some business. Oh, we own only A players. I'd rather focus on the B players and bring them up because there's way more of them you can only have so many superstars and the crowd can like with Wikipedia you know one superstar can't write Wikipedia it's a combina combined effort of many uh, it's definitely uh, you can get more done with super cooperation than than superstardom uh, because skills can be acquired but the mindset that's that's the critical part I, I but I also say that mindset can be acquired it's probably harder to acquire a mindset than a skill set um, but the mindset when we talk about super superstar super cooperator it's talking a lot about mindset which is a hard thing to transition you have to pay attention to getting that skill if you want that if you think it's valuable and the claim is yeah it's valuable let's bring everybody along uh, so, next specification for uh, Global Village Construction Set Core Values Open Source Ecology Specifications. Uh, and I'll go through a little bit, a few of them, because 
they're very much related to collaborative literacy. They're all about collaboration at some cost. So low cost, make things uh, accessible by virtue of low cost, uh, which is the idea that uh, when you have open blueprints, the the actual hardware, the atoms, like everything that comes from the earth is like a dollar a pound in general, from tomatoes to steel. Um, it's pretty relatively cheap. Like rocks you can dig up if you have a piece of land or you can buy rocks for like a you know ten dollars a ton. Uh, but all that wealth comes from there. Um, the point of low cost is that if we have access to information that can transform those raw materials, we can really br have breakthrough performance on, on how we can start up new things or or uh, create new realities from the wealth that's abundant all around us. Okay, modular. Modularity is a key aspect in terms of breakdown of for collaborative development. So the, the large scale paralleling happens through modular design. Break down machines into modules, break modules into parts, break parts into many different development steps. And you can go into subparts, you can go down to atoms, but uh, in principle, you can you can do modularity, break things down as much as you like to, to get a massive what collaborative you, process. What do you have up there on your screen? I have a page called OSE specifications. Okay. So I'm on number five. Simplicity is number six. Simplicity is good, but you can't sacrifice performance. So we we try to do that um, because actually the most advanced design becomes simple. It doesn't become complex. It's when it's elegant, it's going to be simple. Uh, it should be, like I, I think Einstein says, it should be as simple as it can be, but n not simpler. User friendliness. Take care of the user. Like um, I got upset with a tractor a long time ago when it broke, and it broke me. Um, it wasn't designed for disassembly, uh, which is one of the user friendly features. If you if you have designed for disassembly, you're not spending one day just cracking the tractor open. It literally takes like four to eight hours to to break the tractor apart to get to particular thing that was wrong with it in the transmission so it's pretty crazy um, user friendliness also includes the simplicity the transparency open documentation ergonomics now uh, all those things have to be there that you can modify them um, that's friendly to the user DIY is means that something can be maintained more by the individual than by a centralized production facility um, so DIY does not mean it's it's necessarily gutter punk, but it can be decent. Sorry to interrupt. I just got yeah. a text from Jeff Higdon. Uh, it says you're muted on audio and video. Can you check if you still are? Since when? Since forever? No, since I think it was on my phone. And it was set 10 minutes ago. Well, seven, eight minutes ago. Sorry, guys. Well, it's on the recording. Can you guys hear me now? It is the recording, so please review those minutes. Okay, but I don't know what happened. I just got knocked off the sound. Um, so uh, DIY definitely the the user simply that means the user has more control but doesn't doesn't necessarily have to do with oh it's gonna be ugly and unfinished or whatever it just means that you can do it yourself too and if you have powerful tools and access that means what you can do is in incredibly powerful you know um, like building a car in the local micro factory if the tools are there if the designs are there then you can completely do that there's no magic that GM has or Honda has to do that it's it's tools and and knowledge it's primarily knowledge and the more digital things go the more automated the production the easier it is to replicate if you have access to open source automation machines and that's the core of you know major theme throughout the universal axis and the ability to make scalable machines Closed-loop material cycles. That's a very collaborative thing because you're collaborating with nature on that. Uh, there should never be such a w thing as waste. It should be food for the next process. Feedstock for another process. Um, like up to when we have steel cars or steel objects that we can recycle through an induction furnace and roll our own steel, which, which means that cradle-to-cradle -cradle manufacturing and drastically reduced cost of that that is doable on a local scale and could be doable from renewable energy. Now the thing we need to have in collaboration is is the result be high performance. 
But the idea is that if you have enough people, enough eye, with enough eyeballs, all problems are shallow kind of deal. Um, that's the theoretical promise. Uh, we have to meet or exceed the industrial performance of common, uh, common industrial processes. Um, but, but in a sense of integrated efficiency, you can't do like, oh, this is just efficient on, on oh, it's like 99% fuel efficient maybe, but it's like super polluting or something. Uh, you have to take the integrated set of properties. Like, is it uh, good on many accounts for the people, for the planet? Um, it can be performance on one. If we talk about product ecologies, one, one might say, oh, well, uh, the hydraulics, that's evil because it's only 85% efficient. Uh, regular transmission is 95% efficient. Well, integrated efficiency to me says that, well, if we can use that hydraulic motor in 10 or 100 different things, then it does kind of make sense. Especially if we grew the fuel for that from uh, regeneratively, you know, regeneratively from nut crop that we harvest for biomass. You know, like hazelnuts, chestnuts. You can coppice them, you can get biofuel in addition to nuts and soil fertility and all. I mean, if you design a process to be integrated, yes, if it's 85% efficient compared to 95, but you got that 85% efficiency through a wholly regenerative process. Say you fuel that on biochar that you also feed into the soil, so you're increasing the fertility of the soil at the same time. That's way improved integrated efficiency. Well, we're not getting 95% transmission efficiency on the hydraulics, but okay, we've got all these other properties that we're taking up. So you have to look at the bigger picture of um, uh, the high perform what high per performance really means. It's not point performance, it's integrated performance. Ecological design, naturally. Uh, harmonious coexistence between nature and humans. Resilience, uh, that means adaptable, like um, anti-fragile. You're adapting and growing from things. Uh, resilient design that um, if we do our power cubes, for example, from the t for the tractor, and we decide to build a different tractor, well, we can reuse the the power cubes. Let's say uh, we can modify them, we can reuse their components. So modularity gets you a lot of resi resilience in terms of adaptability. Uh, systems design that's a big one in terms of um, designing for a whole system. Like for us, the biggest thing about system design is that the the very concept of product ecology that every single thing in a set, the Global Village Construction set, fits into a, another in some way to make an integrated system. And um, you might say, well, why degenerate the technological basis of civilization to this small thing? It's use, the use of that is that, um, what is it? Is there any use to it? If you have multi-purpose things, then you, you simply need less less material inputs, um, you can do more functions with something so that uh, by that kind of a systems design your resource efficiency improves and things get better. Okay, big thing about lifetime design, so open source I mentioned is a critical component of lifetime design where if you can repair something, reuse parts, because the source code is open, you know how to do it, that's a critical thing like for the cordless drills that we have here, there's really not a big difference between something you could 3D print using off-the-shelf components like say motors or batteries and chucks. Uh, the, the real key is the lifetime design where if one of our drills in the shop breaks, we kind of have to throw it out because we don't know how, what to do about it. We don't have a design file to, to maybe reprint a part. Maybe they don't sell the motor because you don't know where to get the motor. The battery, little piece of plastic breaks off the battery pack and you can't use the battery pack anymore because it won't hold on and you, you know how do you even open that thing up and fix it you, you really can't um, it would help if you had an open source design file you can just print yourself a new case bam you're right back into business so lifetime design is a critical aspect of out outcome of open source design substitutability um, the idea that uh, for anything that you do, as far as technologically or with, with to meet certain needs, you can do do something in many different ways. For example, we can take rubber from rubber trees, or we can grow dandelions for a resin from the roots. 
and that's also been shown a commercially feasible process but we can do that here instead of being in Malaysia and growing plantations of rubber trees so that's the idea of substitutability for everything you can have another option like for oxyacetylene fuel for your torch table well you can split water and get oxyhydrogen which is actually way better um, in terms of its performance so that's that's the idea of substitutability robustness uh, multiple purpose flexibility we're kind of running out of time I think we, we do want to go back into the shop uh, but so let me kind of go through uh, some of the rest uh, multi-purpose flexibility best practices so the key to open source is that we end up picking up best practices because we're we're having many people contribute so you're really cross fertilizing ideas which lead in better practice a complete economy one one aspect of the global village construction set is that you can create pretty much just about anything you would from agriculture to housing to energy production machinery uh, so we do talk about a lot about a complete set complete uh, sufficient set freedom from material constraints that's another property uh, by making things accessible from accessible materials also in, in accessible facilities like the microfactories, that's, that's freedom from material constraints. Division of labor, um, we do some of that. We like to, we focus a lot on multi-purpose generalists, but of course you can have certain people specialize in doing some things. So <clears throat> we like to focus on people having multiple skill sets because then people can substitute for one another. That's a good design principle in, in large-scale collaboration as well because you don't have, um, so it's kind of like reasonable division of labor that, that should really be. Um, if you have a bunch of specialists, then when a task is done, they can't do anything else. Whereas a generalist, when a task is done, you can still have them do, uh, in a large team, contribute many other things. So that's um, that, that works. Um, yeah, so this is a, you can read through the remaining other, there's like 20 more there, or 30 more, but, but those are all the values we try to put into. That. So, so whenever you see one of our machines, it's like we can go through this and say, okay, well, how does it rate uh, on these properties? So we actually defined a little uh, metric score. You can count up, so OSC metric score, that's another page on the wiki. You can count up by points, okay, how are you meeting 1.2 points? OSC metric score, uh, you can actually score this, so you get a number to say, oh, um, the commercially produced car scores like 20 or maybe the open source car scores like 60 by this metric you know something like that so you can have a uh, like a quantifiable comparison for when you're doing something are there breakdowns I assume this is some kind of a matrix are there breakdowns for each one of these points that because it seems a little subjective yeah it is okay. it is it's, okay. a, it's a it's a pretty general general kind of a um, a kind of a hand wavy thing but when there's so many of them you can say okay this thing has a lot of the the compatibility with the OSC system versus like no this is like hardly has any you know yeah are they weighted in any way um, not so much they're uh, I think it's kind of straight through they're kind of kind of equal yeah. I mean, yeah. So take I mean, a look at it. If you have suggestions, no, just I'm just curious. I mean, we no, do the same thing. Please so do. I was just curious, you know, how, um, that, how how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not well it's defined. Really, I mean, it's I've, a really cool application. Yeah, it's definitely useful because it lets you have like instead of just totally arguing about something, you actually start quantifying things, yeah. which is better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can not argue as much. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> basically. what I was trying to see how how quantifiable um, is it. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's at least some is the idea. <laughs> more than none. <laughs> yeah, it's more than none. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you do an open source project and you want to get a lot of people to collaborate, one of the critical things I always look for is if there's a good project, do they have a roadmap? Like, are they just floating by or, hey, they've got a plan. It's like they are after something very concrete. Then you can take a look at that. And you, and you can collaborate with them. But it's important, if you start an open source project, write a roadmap and some vision documents and founding documents, community contracts that, that define, okay, what do you stand for? Where are you going? Because unless you define what you're doing, you'll get mismatched people um, and people won't really know where to go. And that is really why I, I decided to write the book because there's a lot of content here that I would like people to coordinate around. I think we can do a huge deal by writing this down in an easily accessible format um, that people can pick up on really quickly as opposed to reading the wiki, which has got thousands of pages. So 
Um, uh, that's, but that's road mapping and, and setting direction. It's, it's important if you want people to move along because uh, you can have all the tools in the world, but you need collaborators, people to participate. So they need to see where you're going and that needs to be clear. Um, road maps, critical paths are good things to have if you want to involve a lot of people. Um, you can look at OSC roadmap on the wiki, you can see at least. But all of this, like of course, you know, we can add much more detail to all these all these things here. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to cover here, and yeah, I think maybe you want to go into the shop, but, um, but collaboration, when you get down to actually working together, and maybe we'll finish off with this, um, you're designing a process to involve a lot of people. We invoke the concept of what we call collaborative architecture. So when you break down a task into modules, there's the actual physical technical things of, a, of, a, of an object. But beyond that is, well, how do you design a social infrastructure around it, the development infrastructure, what people do, what are the different roles that people take on. If you can map that out and be very clear about that, they can say, oh yeah, person, task, person, task, you can match many people to many, many tasks, but it starts with identifying all those different tasks and ways to, to get involved. So if you can map out a collaborative architecture for a process like Obviously, you would have things like, okay, there's technical developers. But what about other people, like, like media, producing media, totally distributable task, producing documentation, uh, business development, everything. Like, take every activity that goes into society to create a product in, in standard product development. Look at those elements and and create those roles with within an open source context. So you have to start with the concept, what are the concepts of product development? That's a well-defined field. There's many steps, there's many roles, and that's well, pretty well-defined. On the wiki, you can go to a page that I recommend is called open source product development. So there's some critical literature from this industry standards, which is there, that says, okay, this is the standard product development process and we're saying okay how do you open it up how do you make these processes accessible because a lot of them won't be telling you about upload free cat files to a wiki they'll do it differently uh, in a proprietary fashion but we basically take the existing steps that need to be taken and and define well what does the process look like for an open project and actually it's interesting for if you read the product development literature um, and there's a paper in on that page called Open Source Product Development page. Uh, read that paper, but it, there's a paper out there that says that modular open source design is the way of the future. So the leading theorists in the field of product development proper are saying that yes, modular, precisely for the reasons we're saying. You can break things down and, and collaborate massively. And open source, because that's how you're going to build on the shoulders of giants. Everything is built on the shoulders of giants. Those people that claim their own, I don't think are very accurate. That's not an accurate description. You're always adding a slight tidbit on a vast pool of knowledge. Um, for which reason, the, the guys from product development recognize it. They say, yeah, open source development, that is the way to, to get improved results. So um, uh, I mentioned that the future is here. It's not evenly distributed. Well, in theory, the, it's known that open source, collaborative, distributed, or, or modular, it works. What happened? Oh. So, let's do it. So, yeah, open, I mean, that's why I say that open source product development is the absolute clear future. There's no question about it. It's like, when are we going to get there? It does require people changing their mind, mindset about what resource abundance is and starting with understanding the 10,000 number that I mentioned about solar energy. The fact that we are in a civilization that has ample energy. We're not on some some <laughs> like evil planet which has no resources. 
we have abundant resources, right? And then I will maybe end this with the concept of um, expanding that. There's a thing called Kardashev scale. Has anyone said, seen that? Yeah. What is it? <clears throat> so it's it's a uh, theoretical scale that uh, civilizations can fall on, um, going from like zero, which is us, uh, to a little bit past zero. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so a few zeros after the decimal point. Before we're less than one though. So uh, a one is is a. Um, I think it's, it's based on energy. I think we're energy on use. Energy, energy yeah. use. Uh, what, a civilization of, uh, of scale one uh, uses is able to use 100% of the resources of its planet. Scale two, scale two, two, category two is a civilization that uses all the resources of its of the star. Of the star. I think it's solar system or, or solar system. Solar system. I think I've okay, heard most of that. Star, like that. But well, anyway, the similar. So the. Yeah, the important point there is that, uh, you know, like the science fiction guys have already talked about what, what happens when uh, you have access, w like what kind of access of energy we have. And right now, uh, we're using, the, the bottom line is, we're using a muted tiny again. fraction, say it again? You're muted again, according to Jeff. According to Kardashev scale, we are using a tiny fraction of the available energy. Mm -hmm. So, when you kind of expand your viewpoint, because eventually it's like, using all the energy of the galaxy using all the energy of the universe well i don't know if humans are uh, like i don't know if we're going there you can make a claim for yes or no but at this point we're using a tiny bit of fraction of what we have available here the implication of that is if you look at the big picture it's like wow we can do so much more uh so point being in the very wasteful society of today where you know we're wasting tons of energy polluting the environment killing you know killing all nature and all of that um, we're still doing that at a, just by using a fraction of the energy that's available to us well what's that mean that means two sides on one side we can destroy things a fa 10,000 times worse or we can improve things 10,000 times better I'll so, talk to a uh, preacher one he was real into energy and he just used this analogy, he's like, so there's two types of energy. There's energy that comes from Hades. It's the energy that you dig out of the ground and you set on fire. From the underworld. Atmosphere. Literally. <laughs> then, he's like, then you've got the heavenly energy, the one that, that comes from space. So it's like solar and wind. Yeah. And uh, there's two, he's, the way he equated those two things together, I thought was interesting. Well, let's steal fire from the gods and make an open source world. Yeah. So I think <laughs> let's uh, quit at that. And thank you all, everybody in uh, remote That's participation. Right if you have any questions, we'll, we'll take a few questions real quick. But otherwise, we got to build that printer. <laughs> any questions from the remote people? And by the way, it is all recorded. So if you missed some of the dead spots there, you can review this. I'm publishing right after. Yeah. Is a 10 by 10 meter printer viable? Of course. People are making house printing 3D printers. Um, any questions from the, the crew here? <clears throat> just created a page, we could page for the uh, testimonial questions. Oh, cool. The email that everyone, but uh, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. Yeah. Um, questions for interviews. So, so we just got informed here that uh, Adrian's put up a page where we're talking about interviews, interviewing people and kind of getting feedback on how the workshop is going. So there's a page on the wiki and you can catch it probably if, if I did, if you didn't tell me where it was, what would I do for collaborative literacy? I would look at recent wiki changes on the, on the wiki if it's on the OSE wiki. Mm -hmm. So you can get to that if he just said that, if we're all collaborative literate, we say, oh yeah, sure. So the idea is that we all get really good at knowing where things are, who's working on them, uh, what are the changes people are making, and that way it's like, and that has to be where conflicts are resolved, like conflicts as in like uploading conflicts, editing conflicts, it all has to be resolved through version histories and peop first of all, the breakdown where people are working on many different things and the understanding of what the big goal is by people being aligned around something bigger than themselves. 
So that's, that's the general ideas of collaborative literacy. There's much more detail to talk about. And for the full version of that, buy my book, which isn't even out yet. Okay? <laughs> it's going to be... It's going to be free with the, the deluxe version paid for. Um, at you got to pay for that, but we'll make the information. Okay. Well, I'll just say, just read the wiki. It's on there. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Um, we'll do that. Absolutely. Of course. It's going to be. It's going to be. We're, we're, I'll make a call for that. We're, I'm like getting... Uh, just getting started on it. I mean, I've got a bunch of wiki pages that are already up on it and uh, category book. But yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's the way it's going to work is for every topic. It's like, well, I got to, you know, just if I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a claim that okay, I'm trying to summarize what we know and how we can go forward from here as the civilization people. But just open source it. So it's an absolute collaborative thing. So we're going to get huge in input from many people. So the book, I, I'm planning on it to be pretty live. Like you have the version one, and then it could probably keep going as a live version that maybe comes out every year or so with an update, something like oh, that. That would be cool. That would be cool because yeah. then people feed back on it. They're saying, hey, you got this wrong. And it, of course, <laughs> I mean, sure, let's make it all better. Because, um, you know, there's plenty of authors that write stuff. If they kind of like, if they all pulled it together, Question is, do we have the tools to do that? I think so. It's like you publish a book, you use a wiki, and get feedback, and you know, have to manage that a bit, but I think it's doable. Let's collect all that knowledge for a very focused goal of open sourcing a core segment of technology. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, excellent. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you again tomorrow, 9 a.m. Central Time, USA. Take care. And we're going to need many translators for the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs>